chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, I will read from verse 12 to the end. Just in case you have taken long without opening your Bible, it comes after Acts. That will be quite helpful. Romans chapter 6, I'll read from verse 12. I'll read God's word. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the last thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourself unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourself servants to obey, ye servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness, but God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that, f that, that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness, and to iniquity, and to iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants, to righteousness, and to holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things, wherefore ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, being made free from sin, and, and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us pray. God, this is your word. And we know how weak we are, Lord, in listening to it clearly. Lord, bringing it clearly to your people and even applying it in our very lives. And therefore, we ask for your grace this morning, Lord, that would you reveal much truth out of your word, and will you cause our hearts, Lord, to delight in it and to desire that we may walk in this truth revealed to us even through the preaching of your word. Lord, I ask that you will strengthen me, for left upon myself, Lord, your people will benefit nothing. So I ask that the Holy Spirit will be with me even as I, I bring this word and as I proclaim this word, that all may be for the glory of your great name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So uh, this morning we are going to consider a sermon from this uh, book of Romans, chapter 6, uh, where I've read uh, from verses 12 particularly, but I will be going f uh, back to chapter 4 and chapter 5 just to explain the context within these uh, verses I've read have been placed. Uh, but before I, I come to it, maybe just to... Uh, some, some years back, either two years or three years back the line, I was teaching one of my Bible class at school. You know, at school we have a privilege of teach, teaching Bible every morning for around 40 minutes. So I was in one of my Bible class and I don't know where the conversation had come from. And I did mention to my students that all of us in this class are slaves. And one of the students was very annoyed with what I said. He said that he can't be a slave. He can't be a slave, and it became a very big issue that even he, he threatened me. I will go home and tell my parents that we just came to school to call us slaves. And uh, uh, I, of course, it, it made my heart to tremble because, you know, I wonder whether the parents will understand my work is on stake, right? So when things done the other way around, how will it happen? And I, I remember telling this girl, as you go home to discuss to your parents about what I've just said, Please don't just discuss from nowhere. Can you go home and read the book of Romans chapter 6? And perhaps when you come tomorrow, I would want to know what your parents have talked about 
uh, Romans chapter 6, and what I've just mentioned, that we are all slaves. And so when the girl came tomorrow, the, the, the following day to school, uh, he said that, teacher, what you said is right, and I wanted even to make it a bit difficult. I said, it's not just right because I say it, it's right because the Bible says. You know, it, is not, uh, it, it doesn't matter whether you say it's right or wrong, but it's God who knows what is right and what is wrong. So if God has said it, then who are we to say that it is not true? And having said that, my title this morning is, Whose Slave Are You? If you will not be like my student to start asking that you are not a slave, uh, the question that I want us to contend for this morning, uh, before you and in, uh, behind you and in front of you and on your right side and on your left side, you are sitting with slave, a slave. You are sitting with a slave. And I don't know whether you will want me to preach next Sunday, but that is the truth of the matter. The question that we need to ask ourselves, which kind of a slave are you sitting next to? Because in one way or the other, you are a slave. Paul, in chapter 4 and chapter 5 of the book of Romans, has been contending for the fact that our justification, our standing right with God, is not because of anything that we have done or we can do, but our right standing with God, it is just because of what Christ, or it is of what Christ has done. It is by faith through the Lord Jesus Christ that any man, any woman, any child who was born in sin can be counted righteous can be counted not guilty before God. That's what the word justification means. And of course, he continues to talk about the grace that our salvation in chapter 5 it is based on grace and not anything that we have done to earn salvation. And I want to say that to insist, though that's what I'm talking about this morning, but that if we have reached a level of thing that we can be justified before God by anything you can do, that is a great lie you are living in this morning. It where it was justification from Abraham, Abraham believed in God, and it was accounted to him as righteousness, it is still remains so even this morning, so that when you come with your righteousness, when you come with what you can do, or where you are raised from, or which church you go, or where, 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 wherever and whatever your parents were, or where, wherever the family you come from, you are bringing things that will not hold what are broken cisterns. And of course, Isaiah will discuss that as filled rags. But that those who will come to God to be justified, they must just come, depending on the Lord Jesus Christ and putting their faith in him. And that it is by grace. It is not something we merit. Grace simply means unmerited favor before God. And therefore salvation remains so. And therefore if you are here and you have not come to Christ, and this is the reason you are having that I want to make my things look good. I want that flourishing in my life before I come. I want to tell that that is not a biblical truth. We come to before the Lord to be justified, to be made right, be by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And salvation is by grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. And after Paul contending for this truth here, which are very wonderful truths, we need to hold on them. We never need to uh, neglect them. You know, something I think Paul is uh, very logical in terms of his writing. He, he looks at things and even I think he asks questions that people would rise as a result of his teaching. And therefore he has taught about where sin abounds, grace will abound more. That the grace of God is more than our sins. And that is true because that's why we are believers. Some of us are surprised that even God forgave us our sins, right? If you are not surprised, I'm surprised that even, even me, I'm a child of God. Now you want to start following me to know what I sinned, <laughs> why well, I'm surprised this, but they were great sins. Even you us were great sins before God. And the grace of God became sufficient in our life. And that Paul having said this, I mean something will come, and of course it was there also in church history, Somebody will say, okay, if the grace of God is sufficient, therefore we can continue living the way we want, right? And therefore in verse 1 he asks of chapter 6, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And that again, another question he asks in verse 15, he says, or almost the same question, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace, God forbid? And therefore, Paul, after having explained justification by faith and salvation by grace in Christ Jesus alone, you know, he's looking forward to a, a, a situation where somebody might think that because this is true, then we can live the way we want. This is a group called the Antinomians who hold that they can live the way they want as long as they have been saved by the grace of God. And I want to say that if your mind has persistently and permanently hold to the fact that you can live the way you want because God has saved you by his grace. I want to bring to your attention that you are not a child of God. If you persist in your mind 
that you are saved by grace and therefore you can live the way you want. I want to bring your attention that perhaps you have not known the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. For those who have known the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, Titus will remind us the grace of God has appeared, teaching us to renounce all ungodliness. And therefore those who have come to this grace are not those who are saying, anyway, we have perseverance of the saints. Even if Pastor Gith took us through that very wonderfully, we know that the saints will persevere to the end. Even if I do whatever, that is not true. A true believer will not say that. Will not say that. If you continue in your sin with the cloak of the grace of God, then in the first place, you have not come to know of that grace of God. And because this is something that Paul is looking forward to, he keeps here an analogy of a slave. And that's why I asked, whose slave are you? And as Paul is writing this uh, to the Roman church, those, the primal audience will understand this even in a, 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 a better way than perhaps we do today because the, uh, the, the institution of slavery is not so rampant in our world like it was in the, Roman, in the Roman time. You know, Paul is writing this at a time when the church in Rome is made up of the uh, people who are former slaves, some who are still slaves, and some who are free. In fact, it is said that during this time when Paul is writing this letter, that one, a third of the Roman population were slaves. A third would be that 3%, 0.33 they are recurring. So leave alone math, but math is not our language. That 3%, let us go with that 3%. And therefore, if you add together those slaves who are already released, it would be even more than a half of the population of Rome, they were former slaves. And so when Paul is giving them this analogy, they really understand. They are looking at each other and they say, we understand these things. We can relate with them. One of the things they will relate with them, they know that slavery comes with service. Slavery comes with service. That if you are, a, you, can't be a, you can't be taken as a slave to come and sleep up to nine and wake up and take, and take a remote, isn't it? And watch your favorite movie. Slavery comes with service. And live alone even in the world. Now, I don't want to call ourselves slaves, but in a way, we are. If we can use that word slave with the word servant. Are we servants in where we are? The word servant means slave. And therefore, in a way, you can't do the way you want. And therefore, it comes with service. And therefore, they understand that by the way, this slaver comes with service. And therefore, in verses 12, comes and says, Let sin, therefore, let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the last thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourself unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. And of course, when you, you go back, we have to see a few verses uh, from verses 2 here. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer thereof? Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into, a, in, into, de, into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like Christ was raised up from the dead, by the glory of the Father, even we also should walk in the newness of life. And of course, we will continue with that aspect to, to show them that the one you yield obedience to, that becomes your master. He becomes your master. And therefore, he's telling these Roman Christians, let not sin therefore reign your mortal body. We know that all of us are born dead in our sins and trespasses. And the only thing we can do left in that state is to serve sin. It is to be slaves to sin. It is to be servants of sin. But when Paul is telling this dear one that let not sin therefore reign, that means that you have been enabled now not to be not under the dominion of, of sin. You have been now, it has been made now possible in you not to be under the dominion of sin. And therefore if it happens that you are serving sin, you are becoming a slave to sin, it is by your own choosing. That's what he says here, let not sin therefore reign. For sin indeed for those who are dead in their sins and trespasses, sin reigns. You know the word here is given to that of a king on the throne. And therefore if you are not in Christ, 
sin becomes your king sin is the one what motivates you to do whatever you do but it's not so uh, with these dear ones at Rome, uh, in the Roman church and Paul is telling them they should not no longer serve sin they should not serve sin because they are not under the dominion verse 13 neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin but yield yourself unto God as those that are alive from the dead yes you are dead but now you are alive in the Lord Jesus Christ you have been given new life you have been given new you are a new creature in the Lord Jesus Christ and therefore you need not to continue living as those who are under the dominion under the dominion of sin verse 14 he says for sin shall not have dominion over you that is something so wonderful an encouragement for us as believers that sin cannot have dominion over those who have come to the Lord Jesus Christ savingly sin cannot have dominion and therefore if you decide to walk in that you have made a deliberate move to serve the purposes of sin if indeed you have been saved and God has made you alive and you continue in service of sin you have made a deliberate you have made your next uh, Steve to continue serving sin and not uh, serving the Lord who has saved you and therefore he's telling them that these things they need to see that they are no longer living as those who are under the dominion of sin those who are under the reign of sin those who are under the slavery of sin and how much are we supposed to be reminded of this as those who have been saved by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ how much shame have we brought to our church how much shame have we brought to our life by not being diligent to see that indeed we walk as those who are not under the dominion of sin we have not been separate in the world how much have we walked in the ways of the world how much have we gone down like a dead fish down the stream and not resisting the current of this this generation how much have we delighted in the things of the world how much have we loved what should be hated and hated what should be loved and this words of paul to the church at roman it must be also a word this morning that sin does not have dominion over us and therefore a call for us to strive and fight as those now who are not dead under the reign of sin but those who have been given life in the lord jesus christ the christian life is a life of fighting every day not just fighting once we fight every day until we see our savior and our lord and one of the areas that god is calling us to continue fighting is to fight the remaining sin that we shall not call ourselves christians and yet we live as though we are under the dominion under the shackles of sin and what paul is telling these people it's a wonderful thing to be reminded the dear ones that we are no longer under the dominion of sin but at the same time as we remind believers this to rejoice and to be diligent in their work it's a call to you who is here and you have not known the saving grace of god and to come to you pleading with you on behalf of christ that you are under the dominion of sin and very shortly we shall be seeing what you are working for it's amazing that in our sin we are working and that at the end we shall be paid it's amazing if you read the book of romans you will see that that in our sin in continuing in our sin we are working so hard we are working so hard and by the way we shall receive some down payment in this life but the final payment will be done later and so that is not a good payment you want to wait for so paul is beseeching these people never say that you are under grace so you can live the way you want you are not under the dominion of sin therefore live like the children of god in short what paul is telling me and you this morning are you a christian and if you say yes he says then live like a christian and that means in our families that means in the world where god has put us in our workplaces in whatever that we find our hand to do whatever the conversation and relationship we are in we are simply being asked this one it's not a, a main a list of 10 things you are simply being asked you are in tanzania last week even in tanzania live like a christian okay where wherever you are even there just live like a christian isn't it you outside the country where the pastor is not there and your parent is not there you are a child your husband is not there your wife is not there even there just live like a christian live like a christian because you are not under the dominion of sin but that you are now alive 
in the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray that this will be our life as believers. That this will be our, we shall strive for this life. As we rejoice, we are not under sin, but also we shall live it out. I pray that our Christianity will not just be a Christianity of the heart, but a, a, a Christianity that shapes also our outward life as we live in this world and as we seek to glorify the name of the Lord. Again, Paul repeats the same question in verse 15, says, What then shall we, see, shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? And he does say, God forbid. God forbid that that should happen. You know, for those, I'm, I'm not a Greek student. For those who do Greek language, like my brother Ken perhaps will help you later on this. I hear that it's a very strong word in Greek. A word that, you know, you, there is, you, 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 yes. Kuna ile no inakuanga small yes, ndiyo? Na kuna kuanga yes, inakuanga big yes. So here, Paul is giving a very emphatic no in Greek language. That that cannot happen. It can never. Why even should it happen? It can never happen that you, you want to you want say that I can live the way I want because now I'm not under the law. You know, we say that the Ten Commandments of the law tell us we can do nothing on our own. And therefore, the law points us to the Lord Jesus Christ. Or as they would say, the law, the Ten Commandments, they tell us, you cannot obey your parents on your own. You cannot stop stealing on your own. You cannot do, you, can, you cannot give false witness by your own power. You cannot stop all those things on your own power. And therefore, we are left with our mouth closed. And therefore, it points us to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as the book of Matthew chapter 5 verse 17 reminds us, that Jesus Christ is the one who fulfilled all the law. And say, can we find one indeed who has fulfilled all the law, and we only get him in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we say, we hang on him by faith and we are justified. But after believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are pointed back to the law. That which you are not able to do now, go and now live out. Let the commandments of God shape your life on a daily basis. And Paul, with this in mind, says it cannot be, God forbid, that you can be there thinking that you can live the way you want because you are under grace and not under law. Say verse 16, Know ye not that to whom ye yield your self servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey. The word servant here elsewhere, it has been interchanged with the word slave. And therefore he's saying that wherever you serve, wherever you are a slave to that person, wherever you serve, and we know in life, we have, been in, we have been in various enslavements. And perhaps even if you are refusing, just on a general sense, maybe you have refused about the slavery I will talk, I'm talking about, either being a slave to sin, but think about even your phone. How many of us are slaves to our phones? Don't raise your hand. But you know how sometimes you, you, you wonder, one and a half hours just scrolling. And I suppose that Joseph would say, as the phone loves and also you love, help it to love. And you just continue for one and a half hours. And as you continue, in a way you are becoming a slave. And you say, let me put it down now. I will not look at it. Let me prepare my sermon. I will not, put, I will not now look at this phone. Unless I, told my, I, I tell my Jemima, take this phone away from me. And let, let, let me just have it at, at, in the morning. And, and we want to go back. Maybe something has been sent on the church WhatsApp group. And when you go to the church WhatsApp group, you say, Facebook, our church has Facebook, isn't it? And you have many reasons to want to go there. And when you go to the church Facebook, a meme comes, another one, another one, the, a political move. If you, are a, you love politics, and you are there, and you just continue, and you become a slave to that. Some of us are slaves to watching. Some of us are slaves to watching. You can watch up to 2 a.m., you know, to AM, CEO, Sanana Yamjana, Niasubui. You can watch the whole night, but you cannot read the Bible for two hours or even pray for 30 minutes. There is a good example that you are a slave. You are becoming a slave. You know, some of us, when we were in high school, we were slaves to Kangumu. If you have not eaten Kangumu, you will have a headache. And so we are just enslaved to things there. By the way, if you cannot, if you take, if, if you, you say that you cannot survive without taking tea, that, that's an, another kind of slavery that you are depending on. Tea. I, know, I know when we were in high school, there were those teachers that unless they drink something, they are trembling their hands, they cannot write on board. So somebody has to come with a bullet hole on their mouth. Once they swallow, now they can be able to, 
to write you are a slave. So we have slave, slaves of different kinds. But even much more, it is this slavery I'm talking about. Being under the dominion of sin and serving the, the desires of sin. And now let me bring to you one of the slaves that I've been talking about this morning. There are not three, but there are two. And one of that is that slave who is under the dominion of sin. You want to serve sin. You want to walk the way the world wants you to walk. You want to do the desires of the world. You are making provisions for the flesh. That is the slavery you are under. And I want to tell that you are under such a very dangerous slavery. Because as we move on, let me just move on to our verse. Uh, let me read from verse 17. It says, I will come back to verse 17 later, but it says in verses 19, I speak after the man of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members, servants of uncleanness and iniquity, and iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants of righteousness. For when you were the servants of sin, that is where I wanted, you were free from righteousness. And then the question is asked, and maybe perhaps you will answer us for deciding to continue into sin and serving sin and living for sin and rejoicing in sin. What fruit had ye in then in those things? Therefore ye are now ashamed. And we see that the only thing you are looking for is shame. By serving under the dominion of sin, the only payment you are, one of the payments you are waiting for, it is shame. And know that that can happen in this life, but definitely it will happen in the life to come. You are working hard for shame. If all of you, you are going to a job and you are told, one of the payments you will get after working in this company, you will be ashamed. You will be ashamed. How many people will sign the contract? None of us. But already you have signed the contract. If you are still living under sin and doing the desires of your flesh and desires of sin. But this is what the Bible says. That those things which we did, we are ashamed. That's why sometimes as elders, when we are listening to the church membership, our testimonies, we tell people, please just tell us when you are saved. Because even it is a shame to mention those things we walked in before the Lord saved us, right? Maybe you ask, you can tell us and we can smile and do high five. Mine. You will excommunicate me <laughs> immediately from this pulpit. But thank God for his grace that I am who I am because of Christ. And therefore we are saying that these things is a shame. It's a shame. It has said that young people want to walk in fornication and we have pregnant on this. Would you think that you will be courageous to face people? Will you not be ashamed in that? And because I'm having so here with me, I must justify this. Even if you are ashamed, do not abort. Okay? Do not do that. It will be a shame two times. Abortion does not make one a, a, a girl. It makes one a mother of a dead child. Okay? So don't go and do that. But do, do you see the shame it brings? Or maybe you are working an adult and you contract HIV and AIDS or other diseases. It will cause havoc to your, your body. Or even let us say you are involved in corruption and you are arrested. Musiketu ni meshiwa sababu ni lipa pesa ya rafiki. Wal nipatia kunua kitu mi ni kapota skumbili tatu. How many people will visit me in the prison? The way you visited me when I was arrested because of water. <laughs> no one will want to come. Even in fact, I know you might write, I know this judge is very generous. You will not write on the social media. We have, we have no patent parcel. <laughs> In fact, you will not use the, my name. So that, but it, it causes shame. But see in verse 23, it says, For the wages of sin, because we love wages, when we have worked, we want to be paid, right? We want to be paid when we have worked. My friend, this last month, something happened. It almost brought me dist distress. All teachers had received their pay. Now, I was in a conference, so I said, let me be... Let me be agent. I will take my account in the evening. So I went back to the room where we were sleeping. And <laughs> also, you are my roommate, right? You never knew, brother, that I was passing through anguish. <laughs> the evening. So, so I went back to the room where I was sleeping. I said, ah, let me check my account. Perhaps maybe I can send her something before I go back home. And so 
I checked her account and I saw my account was 25.8 for Kani Magna, I remember. <laughs> and I wonder that I'm not paying 25.8 for what has happened. So I said, let me be a gentleman. I waited, I told my wife, please take the ATM, go to the, <laughs> to the equity agent the next day to check if, if, if my, my, my phone is the one that is misbehaving. My wife gave me a report that I was not expecting. He told me what you have seen is right. <laughs> and, and so I wondered what should I do because you know what, I have worked, isn't it? I've worked the whole month and I was expecting pay. Just like, and other people have been paid. Uh, thank God my employer saw that, but after waiting for almost a week in that distress and anguish. And you know what? If you are serving sin, you will be paid. There are wages. Wages are earned. You can't be given a wage that you have not worked for. And the Bible tells us in verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. And that is the completion of the payment you are working for now. In this life, you will receive some payment like the shame we have talked about. Like we have seen the disintegration or the breaking of families we can see in our world today because of sin. With the murder and the death we see in the world today because of sin, that there is a, 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 there is a, a final payment that will be done in the Paul reminds the fashion church that the wages of sin is dead. And I wonder this morning, you are here and you have not come to Christ and you are persisting in serving sin, are you sure that this is the wage you want to wait for? If I want to come here this morning and I say I'm coming to kill you people, how many people will come here? Or you know that what Pastor Waswa said, I got a gun and today's just going to fly bullets on everybody. Who will come here this morning? You love your life, I know, as the way you look at me. You love yourself and it is good. No one will come. But if we are serving sin, we are not fleeing to Christ, that it may remove us out of that bondage of sin, the wage we are waiting that will be a completion of that payment will be death, eternal condemnation. Eternal condemnation. Is that something you want to be paid for, you children who are here? Malipo ya dhambi ni kifo. Je, ungetaka kufanya kazi ambayo malipo yake ni kifo. It's not just death, but it's a death forever. It is eternal condemnation. In absence of God, in, in, I don't know, you go and read the book of Zafania and you will see how it describes how that place will be of, will be of distress. And that's what, you are, what we are waiting for. Is that what you are waiting for this morning? Is that something that you can rejoice and say that I'm waiting for the wages of sin? My prayer that the Lord will open your heart and that you will see the saving grace of the Lord because the next verse or the next section of this verse says, for the wages of sin is dead, but the gift, and remember it's a gift, but the gift of God is eternal life through Je Jesus Christ our Lord. I want to come to you this morning to remind you, if you are under the slavery of sin, this morning by the grace and the mercies of God, your slavery sheep, if there is such a word in English, can be transferred. Even before you leave here this afternoon, utumwa wako unaza kubadilishwa Wewa ambao ulikuwa mutumwa wa dhambi, ulikuwa mutumwa wa Yesu Christo. And this is how it happens. That Jesus Christ, God through his love, he sent his son. That those who believe in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. And he said that it's a gift. He, give, he gave us his son as a gift. It is a gift because in your sin, you don't deserve it. In our sin, we do not deserve it. So it is a gift. of God. Salvation being a gift of God leads to eternal life and it's through the Lord Jesus Christ our Lord. And this Christ with life eternal is still opening his hands open asking come to me all who are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Do you want to live here this morning again neglecting this great, this great gift this great gift of salvation that the Lord has given to us freely and that we can come to him as Isaiah will come and buy without money. Come and drink those who are thus without payment. Do you want to go back at home, leave this service and continue working for these wages which is death? Or would you flee to Christ this morning, trust in what he has accomplished on the Calvary cross and even now, this morning, right now, it will be said that you are a part of those who have eternal life. In the Lord Jesus Christ. Whose slave are you? If you are a slave of Christ. Thank God. It is not by your own doing. It is because 
God worked in your life so mightily. And as a way of responding that we can glorify God, we can live for him, we can let his glories be known to those who are within and without. And if you are under the domain of sin, you are a slave to sin, I want to plead you this morning, your master is not a good master. He is not a good master you are serving. He promises heaven and even he cannot even give a small earth. He posts very great things and there is nothing can fulfill. He has lied for you for so many years that by doing that you are enjoying. Remember when, he, when people are in sin, they are thinking that, are thinking that it is amazing. The more people are under slavery, the more they think they are free, isn't it? You remember the book of John chapter 8? And you know, Jesus is telling the Jewish people that you are, you are, you, you are slaves. And they are saying that since we are Abraham's children and we have never been enslaved. And Jesus reminded them that if you are under sin, you are a slave to sin. May the Lord help you to see the danger you are sitting in that you may flee to him. There is salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. is a gift. Flee to him. Trust in him. And today, this morning, as I've said, you will become a servant of God. What a wonderful thing to be a slave of Christ. What a wonderful thing to miss all the kingdoms of this world. To miss all the pleasures of this world. To be a vacabond or to be alone in this world, to be a lone ranger in this world, but only have the Lord Jesus Christ. You wouldn't want to miss that. Eternal life means great things. Being with the Lord forever, not separated, enjoying his bliss forever, is something you won't want to miss. And this is only through the Lord Jesus Christ, our blessed hope and Savior. Flee to him. Let us come to him in prayer. Our Lord and our Father, we thank you so much this morning. Lord, we... As we have come to you, we rejoice that God, you have indeed changed our slavery. As who served sin, sin in the womb of our mothers, we have now become the servants of God. Oh Lord, help us to rejoice. We may not serve you grudgingly, seeing that we are having a good master. A master who has given us the greatest gift, eternal life. Lord, we are here this morning that those who have come here, they might be our children the teens or even the adults, Lord, who have been coming here. But inside their heart, they know they are still under the sliver of sin. Oh, Lord, may you open their hearts. May you bring them to yourself, for you are the one who has the power to draw. Oh, Lord, may they hearken to the voice of your word, that they may not go and continue in serving sin, whose wage is death. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We shall stand and sing. <coughs> Our last hymn, hymn number 449.